Hi, I'm Tommy Thompson and this is AI in Games, a series on research and applications of artificial intelligence in video games. In this video, I'm going to be a little bit selfish and talk about a game that I made for a change and how AI and procedural generation can build scalable and flexible level generation systems. Welcome to the world of Computra and my first ever commercially released video game, Sure Footing. Sure Footing is an infinite running platforming game for up to four players developed by my company Table Flip Games. Over the years I've made a bunch of small games for research purposes but never with the intent for humans to play them, much less enjoy them enough to give me their money. As such, this is my first ever published game, which is quite exciting! Sure Footing takes the infinite running template seen in Flash and mobile games and expands upon it with a dynamic scaling and reactive procedural generation system that not only changes the game world as you play it, but makes decisions to change its own internal decision making and tweak parameters based on player performance. The goal of Sure Footing is to allow for players to find a playstyle and pace that suits them as they race through the generated worlds, not just with the variety of characters, costumes and power-ups, but also the difficulty of the level generation system itself allowing players to treat it as a mild-paced platformer all the way to an intense Twitch runner. In this video, I'm going to talk about how it all started, the academic research that inspired it, the AI that controls the bad guys, and most importantly, the procedural generation engine that powers the entire game. The engine manages not just how segments of the world are created, but how we modulate the scale of generation over time, how difficulty is encoded, and how we make changes at runtime to try and keep players engaged as best as possible. If you're not familiar, Infinite Runners are a subgenre of platforming games where the player is constantly running forwards and navigating a variety of platforms and obstacles that get in their way. It's largely popularised in Western markets by Flash and mobile games such as Cannibal, Temple Run, Subway Surfers and Jetpack Joyride. Infinite Runners are largely reliant upon procedural generation, or at minimum some basic pseudo-random methods, in order to continually construct new segments of environment for players to run through the longer they survive. This is why I chose it as a test bed for a research project I started back in 2014 exploring how to manage the expressive power of a level generator. Procedural generators can build anything they want within the scope that they are constructed, but how do you model that in a framework that is open to user needs and designer influence? By controlling, or at minimum constraining these aspects, we could effectively manipulate the scale of content and, provided the generated content is linked to gameplay challenge, potentially influence the perceived difficulty of the game. Infinite runners typically handle their difficulty curve with small design-driven tweaks of parameters such as running speed, the probability of specific obstacles appearing, as well as activating new effects that players won't see early on. But how do we maintain that whilst also ensuring a sense of variety and novelty over hours of gameplay? There isn't a huge amount of evidence in the industry of how this is done through frameworks, pipelines and good practice, so I decided to try it myself. While Surefootin is an infinite runner, the design of its level generation system is derived largely from classic platformers such as Super Mario Bros, Sonic the Hedgehog and Rayman. However, some of the smaller design choices are influenced by two infinite running games, Adam Saltzman's Cannibalt and Jetpack Joyride by Halfbrick Studios for the orientation, shifting locales and city skylines. One of the reasons I focused on classic Mario-style platforming is that there's already a lot of research in this area. I covered some of the earliest work in this field a couple years back with the Mario AI competition, a topic I hope we can dedicate another video to in the near future. One of the major influences behind the system was the Launchpad project, a procedural generation system that developed Mario-style levels using a grammar system. This was developed by Gillian Smith, who at the time of this video is an assistant professor at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and Mike Trainer, who is currently an assistant professor at American University. Launchpad is built on the idea of rhythm and beats, where the system procedurally generates levels based on actions the system wants players to do and then dictates how they can all be glued together. Meanwhile, inspiration also came from work by Steve Dalskog, a lecturer at the University of Malmo in Sweden who has looked at encoding platforming level designs as patterns, and specifically looking at Super Mario Bros and how it is reliant on specific patterns occurring frequently and at varying levels of challenge or difficulty. Steve has also experimented with letting machine learning algorithms create their own Mario levels using this pattern encoding. If you're interested in this work, be sure to check out my Legacy of Super Mario Bros video already on AI and Games. 
Sure Footing marries these two principles together. We use the base idea of beats and a rhythm from Launchpad, the constraint modeling process, and encode the pattern formula at both the individual gameplay beats as well as the construction of overall levels. This is actually done on two levels of generation. Action followed by geometry. So let's see how that works as I walk you through the entire level generation engine. Surefooting has so many generators built into it, I actually sometimes forget they're even in there. While the framework that places platforms is the primary system, we also use procedural generation to generate the opening market street, to place the background geometry, to customise the census data players see on the welcome signs, decorate the streets with non-player characters and market stalls, even the piles of crates you see in the streets are generated by their own unique crate procedural generation system. The game is actually rather barren before any of the code starts executing. Surefooting is built in the Unity game engine, and while in-game you'll see the market, the starting screens and all, the game run quite seamlessly. As you can see here in my editor view, only the empty start street and junction exist before the game starts. I build the rest of the game at runtime through a series of volume triggers and time-sliced routines that run the PCG in the background and place new content. What's critical to us is that the game does all of this without compromising frame rate and mitigating just how much players see in advance. We actively try and ensure that players can't tell when the PCG systems are active, as it not only generates new content in front of you, but also removes segments of play behind you. Surefooting breaks up the level generation process into what I call sprints. These are segments full of platforms in between each street area that we refer to as rest pieces. The procedural generation engine is responsible for building a sprint, ensuring it's positioned correctly, generates a new rest piece, populates the new rest piece with content, manages the increase in scale for the next sprint, and then ensures that the backgrounds all align correctly, as well as activate or remove mutators that change the game to make it more challenging. In order for the sprint generation to ramp up and provide an interesting difficulty curve, we apply a number of constraints within a system on startup. These constraints are gradually relaxed during play, allowing it to generate more difficult sprints, but also inject some variety as it swaps out modes of generation and uses new tools at its disposal. I'm going to deep dive into two specific systems, the Sprint Generator and the Sector Generator. The latter is responsible for selecting the locales we visit while running and how the two interact with one another. The Sprint Generator is responsible for looking at the current state of the game and building the next segment of platforming content. In order to do that, the Sprint Generator is broken down into two subsystems I mentioned earlier, the Action Generator and the Geometry Generator. The Action Generator figures out what we want players to experience in a more abstract sense during the next sprint. What are the sequences we'd like to glue together? Does the next sprint adhere to a particular theme, such as running up a gradual incline, running downhill, continual forks into multiple paths, or is it a nice chill route with a lot of flat runs? To do this, the Action Generator adopts the principle of procedural grammars from Launchpad. In this instance, we encode actions we expect the player to complete, such as climbing a set of stairs, falling down a drop, bouncing upwards on a spring, or even just running across a flat piece of terrain. These terms or symbols can then be added to the lexicon of a unique grammar, with associated rules or costs attributed to them. The lexicon of a grammar, combined with the rules of construction, give us control over what decisions that generator makes. It allows us to decide what actions are valid for a given sprint, and even distinct contexts within a sprint, such as ensuring you don't have the same thing twice, or that we don't follow action X with action Y. The system then drafts a sprint by running a search through the grammar while respecting the constraints that I've imposed, resulting in a finite sequence of specific actions it wants players to complete for that sprint. Meanwhile, the geometry generator takes that encoding of the sprint and turns it into a sequence of platforms. This is achieved by having pre-built chunks of gameplay, much akin to the Dalskog pattern model that represents the specific symbols used in the action generator grammar. As the designer, that means I have to sit and make a stack of different variations of the same pattern, such as hopscotches, two and three prong paths, stairwells, drops, spring sequences and more. The system then selects a corresponding pre-built chunk or prefab for each of the sprint's generated actions. In order to gradually scale the challenge of the sprints, each subsystem is built on the principle of a budget, a cost value attributed to decisions made by the level generator systems that constrains the size and intensity of levels alongside the geometry that actually appears. In the action generator, the budget gives us control over not only how many actions are encoded within a given sprint, but also how soon certain actions can start to appear. Each action generator decides the cost or value of a given symbol in its respective grammar, meaning that in some instances a pattern such as a staircase will be more or less expensive in different action generators. 
Meanwhile, in the geometry generator, each variation of a given pattern is given its own cost. Hence I can sit and make different versions of that staircase sequence and through the cost value can establish a continuum of easier to harder versions of that segment. All of these budget values and the like are hand tweaked at design level, allowing for me to better balance parts of the game having playtested it in the wild. In addition to all this, there are multiple versions of each generator. At the time of this video there are 3 geometry generators and 17 action generators. Geometry generators are used for specific circumstances in the game, meanwhile the action generators are swapped out at runtime by the level generator itself, with it dictating how frequently it changes mood and sometimes reacting to what the player has done in game to force a change up. So with the sprints in place, we wanted to add another layer to the game that helps players understand how far they're progressing. To do this we use sectors, fictional locations that change the aesthetic of the game as well as potentially add a new layer of difficulty. At the time of this video there are 10 unique locations in the world with the player always starting in the hometown of our characters Cashville in the survival mode. The sector generation process is responsible for generating the backdrop art assets, activating mutators that change the world as well as triggering the behaviours in the sprint generation framework. Upon entering a sector, we check whether any new mutators are going to be added to the game. This includes visual occlusion, changing the camera orientation and adding elements such as fog. The sector generator places the background art assets for that sector, effectively building the cityscapes, the trench and back wall in such a way that they all snap together. The skyline of each sector is always generated to ensure it lines up with the rest area at the end of the current sprint. Each sector is a certain number of sprints in length, once that threshold is reached, the generator will pick the next locale to visit. And depending on the game mode, there are specific rules and regulations on whether certain sectors can be visited at given points in time, and also whether the player can visit them based on things they've actually achieved. Once a decision is made, this then triggers two behaviours in the sprint generation system. First up, the sprint and sector generator will build a custom sprint that we call a tunnel. This is a forced transition to a specific action and geometry generator that creates a slightly more difficult run than usual. It's used to signify that a sector transition is about to occur, using a special tunnel backdrop and audio occlusion to help identify the change. Secondly, we queue up the removal of any and all mutators to occur at the same time mutators for the next sectors will be activated, meaning a seamless transition between sectors. Next up, let's talk some NPC AI as well as game difficulty. First of all, we have two villains in our game, Deletion Dave who chases you throughout the game as well as Rum Rafster who acts as more of a boss battle and flies in to start destroying the platforms as you run across them. Each of them are actually fairly simple and operate entirely from a finite state machine. Dave is almost always chasing you, with him gradually increasing in speed the longer you survive and can be made to slow down by having him hit active blue crates. But he does have some simple attack patterns and delays between attacks, with each attack actually causing him to slow down a tiny amount. Dave also has a state within which he will actually stop chasing you, but that's down to two things, Ram Rafster and the difficulty settings. <laughs> Ram Rafster has three states of behaviour, inactive, waiting and attacking. By default, he won't start attacking until the level generator permits him to do it. Every sprint Ram Rafster checks whether the level generator will permit him to interrupt and attack the player. This parameter is actually set both in the difficulty settings as well as down to one or two things which are kind of secret about what you're doing right now in the game. Once the level generator permits him to intervene, Ram Rafster will appear on a rest piece street and enable the waiting state. Upon passing him on the street, he'll come to life and then attack you for a predetermined period of time. In addition, based on the current difficulty, Deletion Dave may be asked to fall back into his inactive state in order for Ram Rafster to take centre stage, though in higher difficulties, there's a good chance he won't. So speaking of difficulty, this has been a big part of the ongoing development of the generation framework, tweaking the system so it's more flexible for players. At the time of this video, the game provides custom configurations of the level generator that provide specific difficulty settings as well as the ability to create a custom loadout where players customise the difficulty of individual components of the core design. This is all in an effort to improve the game's accessibility. Accessibility has proven a really important issue during the game's development, largely given how broad the demographic of players we've seen enjoying it. We've seen hardcore gamers, grandparents, toddlers, casual players and more have fun at many of the events we've showcased in the last couple of years. 
Plus, we've had really useful feedback when seeing how players with disabilities engage with the game and learning about how aspects of its design pose barriers that prevent them from enjoying it as much as they could. With over 30 unique parameters in the PCG, enemy AI and more that influence the overall state of play, we can look to customise them in ways that change the overall experience. So with that in mind, we built the Running Pace system. These are essentially difficulty levels, but I don't like using that kind of terminology, given it can prove alienating to players if they are physically incapable of playing on the supposed normal difficulty. Each running pace customises the movement speed of the player, the starting budget values of each generator system, the amount they increase by, constrains what types of obstacles can be spawned in by the generator, what action generators are enabled, whether sector tunnels can be used, what specific actions the action generator cannot do at the start of a game, and whether those rules can relax over time, and the level of aggression of both Dave and Ram Rafster, to the point that on their lowest settings, you can completely disable both the enemy characters. What makes this even more useful is that for some players the gap between one running pace and another might be too extreme and they need to get used to it. So the custom running pace system allows players to pick and mix the setting for player movement, level generation, deletion dave and ram rafster. So if you like playing super fast speed with easy geometry and dave right on your tail, yeah you can do that. Or if you want to play on the lowest speed in movement and try your hand on slightly harder geometry, you can do that as well. For me it's all about giving choice and allowing for players of all ages and abilities to play the game in a manner that suits them. Otherwise, what's the point in building this whole level generation system if it's still implicitly biased against certain types of players? I'm still working on some new research into building an adaptive system for the custom difficulty, whereby it begins to tweak parameters at runtime based on performance so as to push players a little harder the more they play and gradually train them up from one running pace tier to another. But only time will tell how well that works out. Sure Footing's out now on Steam and Itch.io for PC and we're continuing to tweak and update the game over the next year. Meanwhile, I'm porting the game to Mac, mobile platforms and bringing it to the Nintendo Switch and Xbox One in 2019. There's still more work to be done, given there are a lot of prototype ideas and experimental systems locked away in my dev builds. Some might make it into the final build, some might not. But for now there's plenty to keep me busy and hopefully you too. So yeah, I should stop talking, you can go play the game, and I'll go get back to working on it. Gotta keep running, right? Thanks for watching this video, it's a pretty special one for me as it's the first case study based on my own work, which is admittedly kinda weird. This channel turned 4 years old in 2018 and only now am I talking about my own stuff. Pretty scary and exciting to be able to share this with you. I hope you found it insightful, I'll leave some links to papers I've published, other talks I've given and some other stuff I've delivered on this game during its development in the description below. And if you want to follow up on the additions we're making or even tutorials and some of this stuff, let me know in the comments and I'll maybe make some follow up videos down the line. Plus, a shout out to the Surefoot and Dev team, Matt, Molly, Holly, Ellie, Charlotte and Helen who helped build the game you see here today. While this particular video is based on my own work, AI and Games is dedicated to providing insight into AI practices for games in both academia and in the games industry. As such, if you want to know more, click that subscribe button and check out my more recent videos on Dota 2, Starcraft and Total War. In addition, AI and Games is a crowdfunded show and it's thanks to these good people on screen now who support me on Patreon, as well as lovely folks who pass on small donations via PayPal and Coffee. To find out more about how you can get early access to new content as well as updates and ongoing work, head on over to my Patreon page listed in the description and on screen now. Alright, that's enough about me, we'll be back to our regular programming in the next video. See you later!